to other companies, but um, I'd also love to know a bit about you, Thomas, and just your uh, business background. Um, I know you mentioned you've been um, in the business for 19 years, but can you just talk us through your journey and how you kind of got to where you are now? Uh, just a, a, a quick little brief. So uh, I'm, a, I'm what they call an ABC, an American-born uh, Chinese. Uh, I was born in Brooklyn. <laughs> I, I grew up. Uh, I grew up on Long Island in a town called Merrick. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. loved loved my childhood. Uh, very fortunate. Went to school uh, at Harvard. Graduated. Uh, went to Wall Street early, and uh, from Wall Street because uh, at that time my my parents uh, were immigrants to the U.S. They always insisted that I speak Chinese, and mm -hmm. as a kid, I, I hated it. Because, uh, you know, other kids would sometimes tease you. Uh, but it turned out to be one of the best things that could have ever happened to me. Uh, you know, having two languages, as I'm sure Alara, you and many of your friends are in London. Uh, if I could yeah. give a message to everybody out there, you know, being bicultural, tricultural, sometimes you don't know what your real identity is, but it turns out to be a real advantage. You can mix among many. Um, and that turned out to be quite fortunate for me. Uh, because I spoke Mandarin, something that I initially resisted, it actually opened up the door for me uh, to go back uh, to China uh, to, and to work when China was opening up in the early 90s. Uh, and mm -hmm. so that provided an opportunity for me. I've now spent more than half my life outside of the United States. Uh, and so I'm actually dialing in right now from Kuala Lumpur. Uh, so my journey went from you know Brooklyn, Long Island, uh, New York, then to Hong Kong, Hong Kong. I went back to San Francisco to the Valley. Then I went to Beijing. Then I went to Shanghai. And now I'm in Kuala Lumpur. Wow. Okay. And do you have a favorite spot? Is that where you are now? Or would you, are you kind of itching to return to any of the places? You know, my favorite spot is, uh, you know, where, where my family is. Uh, I find yeah. I have many favorite spots. Uh, just like yourself, uh, you know, when you're surrounded by friends, family in a good environment, I think I think home is where where your family is. Um, yeah. And uh, so the, I, to me, I feel like uh, I know at a lot of schools, they talk about being a global citizen. I, I truly feel now at this point in my life, I'm, I'm really a global citizen. <laughs> there, there are many places that yeah. I feel comfortable living in. And that's actually a great trait to have, especially in the business that you're doing. You must be dealing with so many different startups from different backgrounds, so you can almost um, connect to them. So I, I, I would say you're in a good, good, good industry as well. Um, you know, it's, I love it's that. funny. You know, yeah, Laura. You know, growing up, sometimes you felt that, uh, you know, did I really fit in the United States? Uh, and then when I, it was funny, then when I went back to China, I thought everybody would be like, oh, you know, you're one of us. And, and it turned out mm -hmm. that nece that wasn't necessarily the case either. Uh, <laughs> and, and sometimes I find that when I'm in Malaysia, I actually fit in better than the U.S. or sometimes even in China. Uh, so, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's it's it, it's funny how life turns out. Yeah. Yeah. So tell me a bit about Gobi Partners and, and, and the business. Yeah, we're we're a firm. We're you know we like to think of ourselves as a startup, uh, even though we've mm -hmm. uh, we've been almost around now for for twenty years. Uh, we feel that you constantly have to be very nimble, and, and we've evolved mm -hmm. as the venture capital industry has evolved. When we first started, uh, we had a very simple mission. Uh, we wanted to focus on underserved markets uh, where there was a lack of capital. Because uh, right. at Gobi, we believe that entrepreneurial talent is pretty much evenly distributed around the world, but opportunity mm -hmm. is not. And so yeah. when I first started off in the business, if you wanted to do a, a tech startup, you had to go to Silicon Valley. And there were a number of reasons mm -hmm. why. Uh, but I think one of the great things that's happened is that we've gone from kind of a, a unipolar a tech ecosystem where everything was concentrated in Silicon Valley. We've now gone to a multipolar, uh, what I call distributed innovation. And I think mm -hmm. that's, that's going to be fantastic for the world uh, because mm. 
I think what, what you're doing here at, you know, Startup Istanbul, um, you know, this whole concept of entrepreneurship, uh, tech ecosystems, it, it's, it's like fire, right? It's like when, mm -hmm. when human civilization first discovered fire, every country needs this valuable tool. And, and I think one of the yeah. greatest things that if, if, if Gobi, our legacy can be that we helped, right, promote this, this, this tool, entrepreneurship uh, to, to, to all the emerging markets in the world so that people can mm -hmm. really help themselves and solve the, the biggest challenges we're facing now. I, I think that would be a fantastic uh, goal for us to aspire to. Mm. And um, you mentioned the, the challenges right now. There's obviously a, a quite a big challenge going on at the moment, but um, what do you have a specific industry that you look at or do you find um, certain industries or sectors more innovative than others that you really like to focus on? Or are you kind of um, quite broad in, um, in the business? I think, you know, when, when Gobi first started, uh, you know, we were quite sector focused. And I think most, mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, funds, when you first start off, you should do that. You should focus on a particular uh, sector, uh, maybe even a particular country. I, I think now mm -hmm. Gobi has gone uh, we've grown from our original roots. We started off in Shanghai, in China, back in 2002, mm -hmm. you know, when China yep. was still an emerging market, right? It was not considered a mainstream yep. technology market. And I remember when we first started, a lot of people were asking me, like, you know, can, can China really innovate? Mm -hmm. You know, this was just, you know, as, as you know, only 20 years ago. Um, and of course, we believed that, you know, back to what I said before, you know, great entrepreneurial talent is distributed across the world. It's just that sometimes they don't get the opportunity. It is Gobi's job to make sure the great entrepreneurs around the world, whatever market you're in, you get that opportunity. Um, mm -hmm. So we started off there. And then as we grew out our footprint, and I think China proved to be a, a fantastic uh, model for us, because at the time, you have to remember, you know, rewind back. 20 years ago, the mantra from Silicon Valley was we only invest in startups in Silicon Valley within a 25 mile radius of Silicon Valley. And, and that was uh, an accepted uh, truth to a certain extent because it had proven to be successful. I think with the rise of China and with India, and again, places like London and New York, it kind of started showing that. Uh, there wasn't one particular geographic location that would have a monopoly on innovation. Yeah. Um, and so we kind of grew that from China. And, and because, you know, we, we, we experienced some success, it gave us the conviction that this model, that what we were seeing, this pattern would extend to other markets. So we were one of the right. first firms in China to, to invest in homegrown innovation. And then we were one of the first firms to expand from China to Southeast Asia. When most mm -hmm. investors from Southeast Asia were waking up and saying, hey, we need to invest into China. We were going mm -hmm. the other way. Right. And, and, and so for the last 10 years, we've been pursuing a strategy we called uh, Crouching Panda Hidden Tapir. And, and what does okay. that mean? It means connecting yeah. <laughs> North Asia. Right. Japan, Korea, China, with the emerging mm -hmm. economies in Southeast Asia. Okay, I like right. I like that saying. You like that, right? Okay, I'm, I'm glad you did. So you must have seen the movie too. Um, so yeah, and, and and again, now when when people are saying, "Oh, Southeast Asia is going to be a huge beneficiary, right, of the U.S.-China mm -hmm. trade war," uh, it, it has these great demographics. You know, these were. These were trends that we saw firsthand in China, and we said mm -hmm. this was going to take place in Southeast Asia, and, and, and it did. When we mm -hmm. look forward now to the next decade, what Gobi is now trying to do is we believe there's even a bigger play, which is connecting East Asia to West Asia. And, and that's why mm -hmm. I'm so delighted I could be on this call is because when you look at where Turkey is today, Turkey is mm -hmm. on West Asia, 
right? Yeah. It's it's kind of it's halfway in in Asia. It's also in Europe. It's also kind of connected. So it, it's exactly the type of market uh, that that we're very interested in. And and we think mm -hmm. you know when when you're pushing out innovation to the edge, right? To these emerging markets, you know that's where sparks fly, and that's where you know real big problems can be solved. And, and that's mm -hmm. why we want to. We want to be there. That's some really good insights. Um, you know, a lot of we hear a lot of startups um, and you know people advising startups saying just find a problem and solve it. But you you can't just solve. You have to solve it well. So um, just kind of talking about that point. Is there anything that you look for when you meet with startups? Um, do you kind of focus on the team, the founders, the business model, the the revenue model? Um, what kind of ignites that spark um, in you as a as a VC? Well, I, I think a large, as you were saying, you, you focus on a combination. You, you focus on a combination of all those factors. Um, yeah. But at you know, for what we do at an early stage, right? So much of what we do, and, and that's why I'm hopeful that early stage VC we're not going to be replaced by AI just yet, because until mm -hmm. they can invent an app that can scan you. And, and tell me how much tenacity you have. You know, what's your integrity level? How do you deal mm -hmm. with adversity? You know, until a computer can do that, uh, you, you know, we still have some value, I, I think, mm -hmm. in what we do. A key, a key factor that we look for is we're looking for, it's, you know, think back in school, right? Um, you and you know the student I'm talking about, the student who did everything to get a good grade, mm -hmm. right? I was kind of yep. like that. Um, mm -hmm. You did it not because you loved the subject, but you did it because you wanted to get a good grade. Yeah. Right? And there are a lot of entrepreneurs we meet that are doing a startup just because they think it's like getting a good grade. But yep. ironically, it's the entrepreneurs who who don't even care about the grade, but would do it anyway. It's like during this, yes. this lockdown right now for COVID, my daughter, mm -hmm. a lot of her friends, now that they don't have a grade, they're not interested in the subject anymore, right? But there are yeah. those students who, even though school is not operating, they really love that subject because there's something about that subject, that problem, that they just have to understand. And that's the type of entrepreneur we're looking for. Because, Alara, you know, there's so many entrepreneurs who decide uh, to create a company for the wrong reasons, right? Maybe they think it's what's expected of them. Maybe they do it because they think it's a very fast way to make money. Well, I can tell you that's, you know, definitely the wrong motivation. Um, you know, being a startup founder, you know, what the old saying, uh, you know, they say dying is hard. No, uh, you know, starting a company is hard. So. Oh, I, I can't hear you. Sorry. Alara, we, we lost your voice. So, Thomas, can you hear me? We've lost the... Uh, oh, yeah. Yep, I can hear you now. Uh, Alara? All right. Let me ask you a couple of more questions. And um, uh, sure. I, was also, I was also listening to Alara's questions uh, so, um, what are the, the main factors, by the way, why do uh, startups fail in your portfolio? I mean, uh, what is the critical factor? For example, I, I was uh, asking completely another uh, perspective uh, from the outbreak, but um, do you think that this outbreak may be a reason for many startups to fail? Oh, I think it's it's a crisis like no other. It's the ultimate test uh, if, if you're a startup founder. Uh, and uh, I think, unfortunately, for, for many uh, businesses, not just startups, it's going to be what they call an, an extinction level event. 
Um, so it's it's going to be as challenging a, f a period as we faced in our lives. Now, having said that, there are going to be companies that thrive and come out stronger. And I think as, as an entrepreneur, you want them out of this crisis and try to be in a better position than you were before the crisis. Now, of course, that's very, very difficult to do. And um, um, do you have still motivation to invest? Uh, meanwhile, this uh, I mean, recession days, or are you going to uh, change the way of the sectors or uh, the new uh, startups that uh, you look for? Uh, you know, so I think let's split that question into two parts. So the first part is uh, right now, all VCs are sort of like doctors right now. Uh, we've kind of classified all of our companies into those that are on kind of ICU and those that, you know, have gotten an infection, but may recover. And then those, there are those companies that are perfectly healthy and, and in fact may do better. Um, but right now there's definitely a fight for internal resources. Uh, and again, this is where for every venture capitalist, your reserve policies, you know, something that we, we rarely talk about during good times. This is when you, you know, those reserve policies really make a difference. You know, how much did you have to have reserved? How much can you support now the companies that need it? Now, the challenge right now is nobody ever expected, uh, for example, Gobi, we have 260 companies, all 260 companies coming at the same time saying, I need support right now. I need liquidity right now. Nobody ever thought that would happen all at the same time. And, and so that's what I think uh, uh, certainly we're facing that. And I think the entire industry, to a certain extent, is, is facing the same issue. And um, also, are you going to still invest startups in these um, tough times? Yes, in, in fact, we are. Um, we have just uh, we've just launched uh, our Pakistan fund. Uh, and and mm -hmm. so we are looking to invest there. We are about to announce uh, a seed fund uh, in Malaysia. Uh, it's mm -hmm. not public just yet. I'm giving everybody your your viewers here a preview and exclusive. That's going to come. And, and in fact, historically, we've gone through our our records and we've noticed that when Gobi, uh, we've invested, for example, during 2003, right, during the downturn for SARS, and then also during the Great uh, Recession in 08, 09, actually some of our top performing companies all came out from that period. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 and it makes sense because... Yeah. Go, go ahead, go ahead, please, go ahead. I, I was about to say, and that makes a lot of sense because ultimately uh, the research has always shown that returns are always correlated uh, with scarcity of capital. Mm -hmm. So when we look back, I think funds that were able to close their funding, uh, raise their money before COVID, and now have the capital to deploy, this vintage year is going to be an outperformer. Uh, all right. So I have many questions, but Alara is, I think, back. Uh, she has uh, a list of questions already. <laughs> So, Alara, please go ahead, and I'm online with a couple of uh, backup questions here. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. I lost an lost an AirPod. No and, worries. Uh, disconnected for a bit. Um, so, yeah, just kind of following on from the questions that um, Barack asked, I just wanted to ask you um, about you know the current situation. Um, what do you think will for startups, let's go, let's start. What do you think we'll kind of take from this and learn from this? And what do you think, which companies do you think will really um, grow maybe from this, you know, kind of turning a challenge into a positive? Do you think, you know, people are saying food delivery and commerce are really going to boom after this pandemic. Um, do you kind of see that in where you are and um, what's kind of your insight on that? Oh, yeah, I mean, there's definitely going to be companies uh that are winners and there are companies that are, you know, you know, short term losers uh, because yeah. of this pandemic. Uh, you know, that's for certain. Uh, just within our own portfolio, 
Uh, let me name some companies that I think are, are going to do extremely well. We have many companies mm -hmm. in the logistics space. Um, okay. In, in food delivery that have seen their orders go up dramatically. Um, mm -hmm. So we have a company here in Malaysia called Deliver Eat. They do food delivery. They've seen orders go up 30, 40, 50 percent uh, mm -hmm. just versus just month on month. Uh, another big winner in Arpolio has been a company called Day Day Cook in Hong Kong mm -hmm. and in China. What, what, what that company does is it teaches people how to cook online. So they have, it's mm. like a cooking show. Uh, the founder, Norma Chu, has tens of millions of viewers. Their viewership has gone up, I think, almost 300% uh, wow. because of the prices, because everybody's staying at home. They can't go out to eat. What are they going to do? They're cooking at yeah. home. Uh, oh, so, okay. so again, that's a company that's done extremely well. Uh, another company in our portfolio is one called Aerodyne. Uh, they're a global company. In fact, they just uh, acquired a company uh, in the Middle East, and they do a uh, drone as a service. And because of, uh, you know, the virus, uh, the need for unmanned drones to do inspections is only going to increase. At first, a lot of the big enterprises were a little resistant. But again, this mm -hmm. is a, an example where the pandemic has accelerated these the decision making of big companies to adopt unmanned drone technology now uh, for a lot of yeah. their inspections and asset uh, management. Uh, so those mm. are just uh, some kinds of uh, examples of, of companies that are going to do very well. Other companies in our portfolio, obviously, ones anything related to online education, and we have several. Um, you can see a, a pickup there. Uh, I think our companies, for example, in the fintech space, you know, one thing that people touched upon, one of the reasons why I believe China's infection rates, they were able to get it under control uh, maybe a little faster than other countries is because Chinese people now, they just don't use cash as much. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if there's a concern that the virus can be transmitted through the handling of paper cash, well, yeah. China is one of the first countries that's really gone you know, majority, all mobile payments, all they do is, you know, you scan a QR code, they're, they're, it's contactless. Is mm -hmm. this a reason maybe why uh, they were able to bring the virus under control faster? I'm not sure, but but I think there could be a reason. But my mm -hmm. larger point is, is that for fintech companies, anything around mobile payments, uh, anything around online loans, I think those types of behavior the adoption of technology has only been accelerated because of the lockdown around the world. I think those types of companies are going to come out and be winners as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And um, you mentioned earlier um, that you've, you've got 260 companies um, within yep. your portfolio. So within those companies, um, you must have so much experience kind of identifying those that could potentially be um, unicorns. So um, I'd love to kind of hear what you see in a company and what you think um, a company should kind of aim for if they want to get to unicorn status. Well, I, I, I think, you know, the first one is, are you in a market that's, you know, big enough, mm -hmm. right? And, and so, for example, one of our companies is, is one called a Wallex, which has to do uh, with payments and making foreign exchange, basically reducing mm -hmm. the commission rates on foreign exchange. Uh, so they're mm -hmm. building out essentially an alternative uh, to the SWIFT system so that consumers anywhere around the world, when you make a cross-border e-commerce transaction, uh, you're paying much less on the foreign currency exchange rate. That's a huge problem. And, and Air Wallex mm -hmm. has been so innovative in bringing a solution that's easy to use and also very, very cost effective uh, to customers. Uh, and so they've done extremely well. I think they're one of the fastest unicorns to come out of Australia. Again, it also mm -hmm. has a cross border because the team is from China. So very, very interesting. Uh, other companies in our portfolio, like, uh, like a WeLab, again, they've got one of the digital banking licenses in Hong Kong, and, and they've mm -hmm. done extremely uh, well. Uh, in fact, their revenue numbers have gone up uh, because 
uh, of, of the crisis. Uh, another one that you should keep an eye out on is, is one of our companies in the autonomous driving space. It's a company called Auto X. And again, okay. Okay. because of the global pandemic, um, you know, many people are afraid uh, to get on an Uber, right, or use Lyft or use Grab because, yeah. you know, drivers are afraid to pick up passengers. Passengers don't know if the drivers, you know, have the virus. Again, I think this will spur on faster adoption uh, for autonomous driving. And, and so, mm -hmm. you know, company like AutoX, increased demand, government's calling. How do we, you know, how do we promote AV even faster? Because especially in a scenario like today, if you had unmanned vehicles picking up people to take them to the hospital, that might be a very needed service right now. Uh, so, mm -hmm. You know, those are just some examples. Yeah, some really good um, examples there. Um, Thomas, there's been quite a few questions um, sure, from sure. the attendees. So um, I'd love to ask you um, some of these. So the first question um, we've got is, um, which of these, who is most important to investors when selecting a startup, the qualification and experience of the startup team, as in the entrepreneurs, or the business model of the startup? Oh, that, you know, that's tough. Ideally, you have both. Uh, you'd like to see a team uh, that has the qualifications and the ability to execute, uh, mm -hmm. but you could have great execution ability, but if you're executing on the wrong model, that doesn't make much sense either. So it's when yeah. you've got both, you've got a, you know, what we call Olympic Olympians, right? Olympic level entrepreneurs executing on a business model. Uh, that also makes a lot of sense. Uh, that's where kind of the magic can happen. Um, sure. You know, Barack, you had a point. What's, what's a mistake that some entrepreneurs make? I, I think uh, there's a common term in our, our business is a lot of entrepreneurs uh, when they first raise their startup funding, they try to do too much. And, you know, the analogy is they're trying to boil the ocean. So as an entrepreneur, really, you've got limited funding. Figure out what part of the problem you can attack first and do well. Uh, my analogy would be, uh, you know, I've been stuck at home for the last couple of weeks. I've been playing a lot of online risk. You guys know what that game is, the board game Risk? <laughs> yes. And, and you, you've noticed most comp, you know, when you play that game, uh, I play against many players online. Most start off by winning Australia first, right? Because then you can, you can generate more troops. And I was playing that. I think it has some valuable lessons for, for startup entrepreneurs, for startups, right? When you're playing, you, you could go anywhere on the map. And you may see a big market market or a territory in risk like Asia, but Asia is so hard to defend. You want to go after a market where you can build a moat and then generate, you know, cash flow, customers, so you can take that and reinvest and then slowly grow out. So that's the great insight I've had uh, from playing a lot of risk, maybe too much over, over the last couple of weeks. So, in addition to Alara's question, I was very also curious about your uh, new Pakistani uh, Pakistan fund because many of our, our audience is also from Pakistan. Many startups has applied uh, startup Istanbul from Pakistan, so they were right. very excited. Probably because Pakistan is an untouched market, and uh, there are not many uh, VCs over there acting uh, very rapidly or quickly as other uh, geographies. So I think lots of startups here today listening to our uh, conversation may be excited as well. So what is the purpose of Pakistan Fund? And uh, are you going to invest some of the startups? Do you have a pipeline already over there? Yeah, uh, maybe maybe I can tell you why we're interested and how that fits into our, our broader strategy. So at, at, the, at the top of the conversation, I was talking about, you know, how Gobi, we want to be in the underserved markets, right? Underserved markets where there's great entrepreneurial talent, but maybe there's a lack of opportunity, uh, namely a lack of capital, right? We started doing that in China 20 years ago. And I know for a lot of you, it's hard to believe. 20 years ago, China, it was facing an issue of capital scarcity. Right now, China is a capital exporter. 
right? So you can see how quickly the cycles can turn. Uh, for Pakistan right now, what we're seeing the same patterns we saw in China 20 years ago, right? A very large market, very young population, really, really bright, uh, motivated entrepreneurs who really want to achieve something. All they're missing uh, is opportunity. And, and we felt like we should try and bring that. We've partnered up with Fatima uh, in Pakistan. Uh, and we've already made our first investment. Uh, it's a, in a company called Airlift. Uh, Airlift, as you know, uh, is, a, is, a, is a sharing platform for mobility. Uh, they were doing extremely well. But again, COVID-19, you know, really pushed them, along with many other companies, off their plan. But how they've responded, how they've pivoted, how they've used their technology infrastructure to immediately fulfill other opportunities has been simply amazing. The resiliency of the Airlift team uh, has been really, really impressive. And so when we look at that team, we say, man, we definitely made the right choice in backing them. But again, that gives us the confidence there are so many other undiscovered Pakistani entrepreneurs who just need an opportunity. And we are actively investing out of that fund uh, and we're looking for more. In fact, we're about to announce our second and third one uh, very soon. So Barack and Alara, stay tuned. Uh, if I have another opportunity, I'd love to share that with you. Uh, really, really interesting companies. I mean, uh, we will be very happy to welcome you Istanbul on stage. Uh, hopefully after the outbreak uh, comes to normal and you will be able to also announce this uh, new fund and also new uh, investments, hopefully in Istanbul in next upcoming months of of course you know october or uh, other uh, event and we will be very welcome and uh, another question what is the most important thing uh, that you look in the entrepreneurs while in an investing meeting or what are the red flags uh, that um, i mean uh, uh, entrepreneurs should not be uh, doing in an investor meeting I, I think the, the, the simplest red flag we see all the time is, you know, when an entrepreneur comes in and they're not all in. And what do I mean by that? I, we've met so many entrepreneurs, you know, great business plan, a great presentation. And then we say, well, fantastic. Uh, you know, are you, you know, you're great. We want to fund you. And then we find out they're only in it part time. And we're like, wait, what do you, what do you mean it's part time? They're like, oh, well, I'm only going to do this great thing unless I get funding. And so you can't be kind of hedging yourself. Entrepreneurs, if, if you are serious, you've got to be all you've just got to be all in. Right. You can't be hedging yourself. Uh, I've, I've, I've heard there's a term called riskless entrepreneurship, um, but that's I don't think that's the right application. So that's one. You have to be all in. You can't be saying, well, if it gets funded, then I'm going to come in. And if it's not, then I'm not going to do it. Um, we're looking for those entrepreneurs. Like I was saying earlier, Alara, there are those students who love a subject and will study. They just want to know about it, even if there isn't a grade. We're looking for those entrepreneurs who would do the startup, even if they couldn't get funding. Right. Because they think that problem is too important to solve. So that's one red flag. The second red flag we always see is, you know, we meet a lot of entrepreneurs. They're all in. But then we say, OK, well, great. Show me the cap table. How much money have you committed to this startup? And then when they say, I've committed nothing, I've got my money in uh, in bonds because uh, that's the risk free way. And I don't I wouldn't I wouldn't put my own money into this company because that's too risky that's immediately a red flag, right? I mean, if it's too risky for you, I mean, why would we be doing it? Um, those are kind of immediate red flags that we see. The other red flag, you know, we always see is when the chemistry among the founders just isn't right. And you, you can see that, right? There are a number, a number of examples where we've had founding teams come in pitching to us and just started fighting at the meeting. And we're sitting there going, uh-huh, continue. And we're like, oh, my God, we, we better not be investing into them. Um, so those are just some examples. 
<laughs> so uh, thank you for uh, these uh, insightful uh, feedbacks. Uh, I mean, it will be very valuable for the next uh, entrepreneurs who are going to meet you probably. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, Alara, you lost your voice. So, what hey, are the... Yeah, so yes. I was going to tell you, while we're waiting for Alara, I just want to let you know, our Philippine fund is also investing as well. In fact, we just announced an investment in the Philippines in a company called Kumu. Kumu. And so, again, they're, they're on kind of the, uh, the live streaming. It's a media site. And, again, that's Perfect. a company where everybody's been at home. So they've been doing more kind of live streaming and that's a company uh, that we just went into. In fact, it was just announced uh, yesterday. So Barack, my, my point is, despite the challenges the venture industry is facing, Gobi, we're actively in the market. In fact, we're gonna announce a, a new fund in Malaysia as well. Um, so, so, so there is capital out there uh, for entrepreneurs and I'm sure many of, uh, your audience that's listening, um, th there there are sources of capital still. I mean, um, uh, follow up these uh, comments. Which kinds of sectors will be affected after this outbreak? And what do you recommend for startups to look for new problems uh, in new sectors? Or uh, should they be at the same uh, area that they are working? Or what, what are your comments about it? I think like many people on the call, I think uh, the global pandemic has given us all an opportunity to reflect, right, by being at home. And uh, I'm certainly no different. And uh, and I've just been thinking, and, you know, this is the first time, and I'm just sharing it with you and your audience right now. I, I really think this global pandemic, I mean, we can look at it from a very negative standpoint, Right. And uh, we can say that the pandemic is causing the world to split into different camps. Countries are looking inward. We're going to go back to the days of protectionism, etc. Mm -hmm. But I'm a venture capitalist. So by nature, I'm an optimist. Otherwise, I wouldn't be in this business, right? I prefer to look at it another way. I think for many of us, we're going to come out of this pandemic and realize even more how interconnected we are right and so for all those people that are talking about you know building walls you know turning inward i think for most people we're going to realize that our interdependency is even greater and, and the pandemic has been a wake-up call yeah in, in case we didn't realize it before this thing is just kind of like punched us in the face said hey you know what yeah, maybe you're in Turkey and I'm in Kuala Lumpur, but you know what? We're all part of the same species. And this virus has really highlighted the fact that we are one species fighting for survival, right? And think about how fragile, you know, everything that we've built is so fragile. And to maintain that, it's going to take an even greater effort by the entrepreneurs to solve the really important problems. And so I do believe there's going to be a shift. And in fact, we've had a lot of these conversations before. I think, you know, there's so many smart people right now out in your audience and they're thinking, oh, hey, I'm going to do a startup and I'm going to help e-commerce companies get a better conversion rate. Uh, so more people will buy stuff. And, and that's worthwhile as well. But I think for many, many people, they're going to come out of this crisis and realize I have an opportunity. I need to really solve some of humanity's biggest problems. And if I'm going to be an entrepreneur anyway, why don't I go tackle some of these really big problems? And, and the, the problems we had before COVID-19 are still the problems we have, right? Climate change. Um, you know, here's a question I keep asking people. You know, right now there's a scarcity of all those masks, right? Yes. Uh, when this crisis is over, we're going to have one of the biggest garbage disposal problems. What are you going to do with all those masks and, and scrubs? Somebody's going to have to go figure that out, right? That's going to be a probably a big opportunity, but it highlights a bigger issue, which is climate change, pollution, 
uh, food security, sustainable farming, all these issues are still there. And, and I think venture capitalists, we're gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna sit back and go, okay, you know, we funded so much innovation, but now when you sit back at this moment of crisis, you realize, you, you know, how much of it, you, you know, is, is, is impactful that when we think back a hundred years, you know, that's something people are gonna say, wow, that company really made a difference. And, and what do I mean by that is we've solved so many problems, right? Through mobile phones, we've connected the world, right? The cloud has brought enterprises along. So we're all interconnected. So the next question is, what is it all for? Because when you look at it, you know, there's still cancer. We haven't solved cancer, right? And, and for me personally, I'd love to see someone bring some innovation into air travel because those seats are really uncomfortable. Somebody should really figure out how to make air travel better. But my point is, there are some really, really big problems. And I think entrepreneurs, and I think VCs now are gonna be like, we need to fund those because those are the issues that really, really matter. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's a concept we call, I, you know, we're still playing around with it. I'd love to get your audience's feedback. It's, it's almost a concept of purpose-driven innovation, right? And, and Originally, we had a term, and that's why we were in Pakistan, is we had a term called taqwa tech, which was, you know, taqwa is the Arabic word for faith, you know, walking with mm -hmm. God. And we thought that just applied, you know, about innovation for Muslim markets. But now as we really, as I understand what that word taqwa means, I really think that it has tremendous meaning and significance for the next decade, because taqwa, from what I understand, really means walking with purpose. And, and I think for the for, for when entrepreneurs, we're going to look back, it could be a turning point for entrepreneurs to now focus on more purpose driven innovation. And, and again, a lot of that is aligned with the United Nations, you know, the sustainable development goals. There are so many worthwhile uh, goals mm -hmm. that we should align to. And I think more and more entrepreneurs are going to heed that call and really join this fight uh, so that we achieve some sort of a better harmony uh, with this with this earth, with this planet. Uh, and so Perhaps. I think that's one of the key changes. Yeah. I understand your uh, point of view and uh, answer. I mean, um, quite insightful. Challenging uh, to your question, of course, for example, the, the VCs who have been funded or uh, cash-rich VCs going to probably invest in this period. But do you think that LPs uh, will be motivated to fund new VCs or capitals in the coming months or coming years because of uh, uh, the uncertainty? You know what? I, I That's a great question. And I think they better. Because, you know, so many of these big pools of capital, right, whether it's an endowment fund, whether it's a foundation, pension funds, these big sovereign wealth funds, you know, to a certain extent, they're very conservative because they keep telling people we have to be conservative because we're saving for a rainy day. Am I right? Yeah, sure. I would argue the rainy day is here. We're in the mother of all storms. If you're not deploying that capital now to really come up with solutions, you know, what, what, are, you, what are you saving it for, right? So again, there's no shortage of capital in the world, right? And I take your point. I think that's going to require a, a change in mindset. But I think, though, to be fair, that's already happening. Think about all the impact investors uh, that are out there. People are realizing that the capital isn't to be hoarded. It's, 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 it's merely a tool that has to be used to be shared, right? Mm -hmm. And think about it, interest rates are so low. You, you know, what's that money for if not to make life better? And so that's a, that's a great question, Barack, that I'd love to have a discussion with, with the larger LP community because there's no shortage of entrepreneurs that, that want to make a change, but you're right. 
You, you know, the, the, the people who have the capital, they're saving it for something. I don't know what. Yeah. I understand your also answer very uh, clearly, but I mean, depend. I mean, I have checked out CB Insights latest uh, statistics. Of course, Q uh, first quarter is not uh, uh, the the statistics probably are not collected yet. But I mean, the the number of uh, uh, um, investments and amount of investments are uh, decreasing. Of course, we will see a sharp decrease in the second quarter and third quarter, hopefully. I mean, I understand your uh, answers in uh, the previous two questions. Yes, you are very positive, but uh, uh, do you think that other uh, investors are positive as you are? And do you think that they will still insist on uh, investing uh, cash uh, on risky periods? I, I think the uh, the sophisticated investors will, will, will do it because Historically, the, again, the research uh, has has shown the mm -hmm. highest returns are made during periods of crisis when there's a scarcity of capital. So uh, I, I know a lot of this, the things I said may sound kind of uh, very kind of idealistic, but I think there's a real strong business case to be made as well, right? If you think about uh, when when people when sometimes when people when all they see is risk, they miss out on opportunities, right? And I can point back to my experience, you know, back again, back in China, right? In 2002, everybody I met was telling me, oh, China's so risky, they can't innovate. And, and look where it is now. Uh, I think the same, uh, the same skepticism probably could be applied to India. Uh, and for, again, I think a lot of the, uh, what I was talking about before, Probably people are skeptical, yes. But again, for every skeptic out there, for every 10 skeptics, all it takes is one person who believes. And if that person gets it right, there's a there's a big return. So risk and reward always go together. Alara has questions, but my last question will be, depending on uh, your comments, uh, what do you think about the SoftBank situation? Well, I think again, the SoftBank situation, you know, great headlines. Um, I certainly feel, uh, again, what he's done, uh, again, from a long term perspective, there, there are a lot of people who want to, you know, get on and, and throw rocks. You know, I'm not like that, and neither is Gobi. Um, are there challenges uh, to what they're doing? Of course. But I think, again, what Masa was trying to do was he was very long-term positive on the transformative power of technology. And I think that's what we should be looking at. That trend continues. And I think COVID-19 has only proven that the adoption of technology is only going to accelerate. Now, he tried to disrupt the entire VC industry. So again, back to my risk analogy, you know, he didn't play it safe. He just took all his troops and you know, tried to take over the entire map at one time. And it remains to be seen how that turns out, right? But I think, again, what he was trying to achieve, uh, there, there are certain things that I think uh, were, were quite worthwhile. Do you think that the valuations will go down or uh, the valuations will be affected uh, in this period, by the way? Of course. Of I mean, that. Yeah, of course. I think, look, any startup that's coming in, uh, you know, in your own mind, valuations need to be re readjusted at least 50 percent lower uh, as a starting point. It may even go lower. It's just because, you know, everybody's in a risk off mood uh, and there's a scarcity of capital. Right. So that's to be expected. But again, the entrepreneurs who, despite these conditions, are willing to push ahead. Those are the entrepreneurs that are going to be successful. Absolutely, Perfect. no question about. It. Alara, uh, do you have any uh, additional questions from our audience? Maybe. Yeah, I can um, read out maybe a couple. All right. Okay, I'm, I'm glad that you guys can hear me again. Um, <laughs> so, uh, Thomas, this one thing quickly. Can you give some insights into your uh, fund size? So. Um, you know, what's your typical investment? Um, where, yeah, 
when you're when you're looking to raise some funds? Uh, you mean to invest into companies? You mean? Investing into companies, yeah. Yeah, so we have uh, multiple funds. Uh, Gobi, we're we are a full stack venture capital firm. What I mean by that is we'll go seed stage. Uh, we'll write checks of a hundred thousand U.S. in the uh, seed round, mm -hmm. five hundred thousand in the pre-seed. We'll do one to three million in the A rounds, and in the B C, the B to C rounds in the growth stages, we'll write anywhere from five to twenty million U.S. So again, it depends on which fund. Uh, in which geography uh, mm -hmm. we don't necessarily have a growth fund in every geography we're operating in um, mm -hmm. so so again it depends on where that startup is located uh, but again if we like the company we'll find a way to get it funded yeah and do you think right now is a good time for a startup to go through funding um i've seen a question from i think an ed tech company um who i think are you know, going ahead with a funding round, would you recommend them to pause or would you, for any startup, would you just say hold off on your funding round or go ahead? Well, look, this environment right now is a test, right? And our business is about finding the outliers. Mm -hmm. So if most people are telling you, hey, you should pull back because the mood, look, don't get me wrong. The mood is very, very negative. I mean, this is, you know, in terms of historical perspective, this is as bad as it's ever been. Mm -hmm. But what I'm saying is for the entrepreneurs who choose to push ahead, that is a huge message that you're sending to potential investors because 99% of the people out there are going to hit the pause button or give up. If you're still one of those people that are willing to go ahead, well, it says one of two things. A, you either really believe in what you're doing, which is great, or you're kind of crazy, which can be also great, right? VCs like to invest in, you know, guys who are a little crazy. I mean, not too crazy, but, you know, any entrepreneur has got a little crazy in them, right? Yeah. So what's interesting about this type of a time period is it acts as it's the ultimate screening process. Anybody who had motivations that were not pure, for being an entrepreneur, they've all been scrubbed out. Mm -hmm. The yeah. only guys who are remaining now are the true entrepreneurs. So it really kind of makes our job as a venture capitalist a little bit easier because anybody who's still trying to raise, you know, those, those are the folks that are really, really serious. Absolutely. And I just want to end on um, more of a positive question. What's kind of, you know, getting you excited now looking forward in the industry and um, are there any specific vectors or industries that, you know, you say or you would recommend to, to us in the audience, you know, really take a close eye at these guys or this company or this industry? What's kind of, you know, getting you through this time? Well, I, I think for us, this, this thesis around, again, connecting East Asia to West Asia, uh, for us, Gobi's push into the emerging markets, particularly uh, the Muslim economies that we've, uh, you know, we've put that sector we call Takwa Tech is only becoming more important. Uh, we think that that's going to be one of the biggest opportunities going forward. Um, yeah. and, and again, we've opened up an office now in Lahore, Pakistan. We've also set up now an office in Riyadh uh, in Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. um, we've also now are looking to set up offices in Africa. We've invested into an accelerator there. They've got a presence in Nigeria and in Kenya. Our view is that instead of looking at all these emerging economies separately, somebody needs to look at them more holistically. Mm -hmm. and, and we think that that's going to be a huge opportunity because the problems that we're facing right? Whether it's this virus, whether it's the locust swarm, they don't think in terms of national borders. Yeah. And I don't think entrepreneurs should be thinking that way as well. But where the VC industry has lagged is there are very few VCs that have created that sort of a infrastructure or network to create a platform that kind of connects all these emerging economies together 
And I hope that Gobi can play a very small part in doing that to really help that next generation of entrepreneurs because the problems that the next generation of entrepreneurs are going to have to solve are going to be the toughest ones yet. I really believe that the low hanging fruit, you know, has been plucked. Yeah. Right. That, that next generation of problems, that's what we really need to solve. Thomas, and they're hard. They're hard. Thomas, yeah. thank you for this valuable experience and insights. Uh, also, thank you for your positivity. And we need uh, your positive vibes uh, all through the entrepreneurship ecosystems all over the world, I think. And uh, uh, we wish you uh, safe and healthy days. Uh, and, and thank you. Uh, I'm just so delighted. Uh, it's great, again, to talk to some other, other folks, uh, especially on the other <laughs> side of the world. And again, I, I've noticed from some of uh, the audience, they want to be able to reach us. Yes. Uh, maybe again, they can send us an email at marcom at gobi.vc. Uh, again, M-A-R-C-O-M at gobi.vc. And I guarantee you, if you write us any ideas, we will respond immediately. Uh, we're all under lockdown in Malaysia anyway. Nobody's going anywhere. It's the best time to reach out to us. Um, so again, we'd be delighted uh, to build uh, a relationship, get to know some of your audience. I see some really great questions. And um, I hope to see you in person very soon. Yeah, we hope to see you in Istanbul. Too. Too. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thomas. Okay. Have a great day and stay, stay safe and healthy. Yes, and to you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.